I'd love to say, there we go. Um, here's what's happened. When I set all this up to do all these different various topics on discernment and, under, and defending the faith, that's what I had started originally in my head, was just on discernment. How can we tell the difference of different things? How do we know biblically uh, of, of various things? I said, this is the categories I think we need to cover. And I kept going through different things. And, and if the Lord was really in my head like he should have been, I should be doing Christians and politics this week and not next week. So Christians and politics will be next week. But please vote Tuesday. Uh, that's our, you know, you should be, we should be informed voters. But we'll deal with that next week, Christian and politics. I said, I'm going to do Christian music. That's how I titled it, Christian music. But how do you define Christian music? Is it music because a Christian listens to it? Is it music because a Christ, Christians are in the band? Um, is it music because of the, is it Christian music because of the content? Um, is it Christian music because we sing it in different environments? What makes it Christian music? And I said, that's, that's a topic, um, if I wanted to, I would take every Christian band and say, here's what they're about, here's who their background is, here's who they support, this is what church they came out of. And we could be here from, to, and never cover anything that we need to, because I really think, Music, whether Christian or not, is a personal choice. And sometimes I think people's personal choice is horrible. I don't think there's any such thing as rap. I just don't. I have troubles with country music. I think it's like an oxymoron. That's me personally. But there are a couple of country songs I like. But I like better when you play them backwards because then the wife comes back and you get a new car and the dog's alive and... We're, we're good with Christian music, so. But in essence, what I really wanted to do then, when, when I started saying this, is, is grasping the idea, what is the purpose of music? We use it in church. Is it, if we do music, is that worship? Because some people will say, now we're going to do the worship service, and it's always what? About music. Is that really worship? Is it a call to worship? Is Christian music about evangelism? There are a couple of Bands out there that claim that every time they're out there doing their gigs, that they're evangelizing people. But then you listen to some of their music, and there's no gospel message at all in their music, or even what they give. I'm saying not all, but some. Um, I'm not a hater of Christian music. I want to make that, you know, I'm, I know a lot of music from the 60s, 70s, 80s, even today's somewhat music scene. Um, David calls us in the, in the Psalms to meditate day and night on the Word of God. Yet David tells us that in the musical part of our Bible, which is kind of interesting. Now we've got to ask ourselves this, is all Christian music good music? I mean, if we were to say and evaluate the music, it's all good music. Um, and again, we're back to the same thing. That's individualistic, isn't it? And yet we're coming to the Bible, and we're studying the Bible, and we don't know what God says about music. Um, so we're going to kind of examine it from a different, couple of different views this morning. Uh, um, and the main view I want to do is make sure that we're looking at the Bible for our understanding of music. So it's going to be a difficult transition, so bear with me this morning, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to use it to segue into communion by singing a song that I've kind of fell in love with, um, and it's not in your hymnals, and it should be, so when I give you a copy later, fold it in half and stick it in the hymnal, okay? Remember, I'm not going to repeat it. Fold it in half, shove it in the hymnal. Um, it's interesting, though, the Song of Solomon is a song, and it's what kind of a song? It's a love song. It's, it's considered the song of all songs, and how many of us have sat down and sang the Song of Solomon or even read it? And what's the music that it goes to? What's the tune? How does it go? I really think if we examine the Word of God, we'll get tune. We'll get meter. We'll get uh, rhythm. And we'll see that this morning. And that's my goal of doing that. Uh, there are different churches with different approaches. How, how they do music. Um, some of them I totally disagree with, especially when you're walking in the door and they're giving you earplugs. There are churches that do that today. You walk in, you get earplugs. I'm going, what's this for? The last time I received earplugs was at a race. Um, I believe it is a very sensitive issue. Uh, 
because many people just listen to a lot of music and like what we would call Christian music. Um, so we're going to examine it today. Um, but I think many things come under this umbrella idea of music, Christian music, worship music, the whole idea. What is the difference between what is coined contemporary Christian music uh, or CCM? I may refer to that a little bit this morning, not much. What is CCM? What is Christian praise music? What's Christian jazz? What's Christian rap? If you see, they're genres within genres of music. Um, how do they match up? When we listen to a Christian song, how do they match up to their secular counterpart? Can we tell the difference? And one of the ideas I was going to go into is matching them and saying, what is worldliness? I said, no, that's not the avenue I want to go. So we could have gone many different places with this this morning. Uh, I've heard as a pastor, these are the things I've heard been questioned about Christian music. Uh, whether it's a hymn, some people said to me, this happened in the same service, actually here. Uh, somebody came up to me after church and said, Connie played that too slow. I said, okay, I, I don't know, the, and I wasn't going to go up to Connie and say, I think you played that too slow. Not five seconds later, somebody else who was right behind him and said, Connie played that too fast. So I'm, I was like playing baby bear. I think she played it just right. <laughs> uh, as long as we do that. What is our part as believers in the church body? How do we interact with that music that's played within the church? Uh, does contemporary Christian music have a place in the church? Somebody comes up, that's what people will say. What somebody will also, uh, might come up and say, why is no one singing? Why is it, we're, we're, we're doing a song and we look around and no one's, there was a, and that becomes performance, which almost is a form of idolatry in the church, um, which we're not going to chase that rabbit of all, at all today. Um, some people will say that song, I couldn't follow it, I didn't get it. Some people need songs to say Jesus in it. So if we say Jesus, 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 I love you, then we just covered the base and then we can say whatever else we need to say. Uh, but then this morning, I want to fit this topic within the confines of defending the sheep, uh, the faith, which is my responsibility to feed the sheep. Well, I want to defend the faith. So I want to look at music from both an Old Testament and a New Testament uh, method. I want to look at it. But it's going to take some time to get there because I got a long introduction. Uh, and by doing so, um, I want you to understand something. Of all the lessons I've covered, this one's been the toughest. I've have hundreds of pages of documentation. One of my favorite was this one. It's called "Here I Raise My Ebenezer: The Importance of Hymns in Worship," written by a 17-year-old at Lizzie School. Fantastic paper, but it's written by a 17-year-old. Hundreds of pages of documentation. I've read at least 10 books from various viewpoints on Christian music. And I still come to the same place. Music is very personal. Yet, it's meant to be corporate. So we need to find the balance, how, how it equalizes that we all can participate in a form of music, yet it may not be our personal preference. Uh, my music... Or your music can't become the other person's music. I can't force my opinion on you. Uh, if I had my choice, we'd have jazz going on all the time. Because I think it's the purest form of music. And that's my opinion and I'm sticking to it. Um, some people will say some of the older hymns, that's hollow grounds. Don't get rid of the, the older hymns. We've got to sing the older hymns. Uh, I, there's over 400 hymns in our hymn books. And here's my problem with it. How many of you have any of them memorized? Yet, most of us, and I'm looking at me mostly, I can tell you the songs of the 60s and 70s and probably sing along to a lot of them. Uh, so today we find our, our, this lesson is going to be somewhat corrective for all of us. It, we, we, we need it. We all need it. Um, some may find this lesson warranted. Um, it's about time you said something about music. Um, I want it to be more than anything, though, thought-provoking. I want us to think biblically about this. Um, some may even find this message irritating. I got it. Um, I don't want to step on toes. Um, listening to this, a, a guy do a, a thing on music, he says, I, I think church splits have been happened over music more than anything in America. And I think that's interesting. Um, James said something, I don't know, where are you? Uh, James said something to me before class that one of the things 
the Baptists are looking at us to be more contemporary in their approach to church. What does that mean? Well, probably incorporating contemporary music in. Is it right? Is it wrong? And I think after we done this morning, we'll see it. Listen, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. The time music was beginning to mount more of an influence than any other time in America. Just think of it, what came out of the 60s and 70s. I happened to be able to go from reel to reel to eight to cassettes. No, let's see, reel to reel, uh, eight tracks, cassettes, Walkmans, CDs, DVDs, MP3s. I've been through them all. So we can find various ways to look at music. Uh, we had the Beatles and the Beach Boys in America. We went from AM to FM. From FM to f one speaker in a car to four speakers to six speakers. And now they got these blasters in the back that everybody's hearing their music. They're going deaf. What I remember is a song would come on and everybody in the halls of school was singing it. You remember those times? We had bands named for cities, Boston, Chicago, the Miami Sound Machine. We had, bought, we had, we had bands named for, city, uh, for states even, Kansas and Alabama. There was bread all the way to Motley Crue. Churches were also picking up on this trend. There was a group called Jesus People. There was up with people. There was the Continentals, the Imperials, and the Gaithers. Jesus was getting his groove on. The Doobie, Doobie Brothers came out with a song and stated, Jesus is just all right with me. Thank you, Doobie Brothers. Because DC Talk picked up on it and remade it in 1992. And it was, Jesus was just all right with DC Talk. In his book, The Closing of the American Mind, Alan Bloom states this, and it's a very a fantastic book, secular uh, viewpoint. He's writing on music, and he says this is the effect on children, the music effects on children. He says this. From a paper written by, um, what he said in, where did I do that? Oh, here. Hang on. I got to read it from my attached. He says music business is particular only in that it caters almost exclusively to children. I bet you didn't know that. Treating legally and naturally per imperfect human beings as though they're ready to enjoy the final or complete satisfaction. It perhaps thus reveals the nature of all our entertainment and our loss of a clear view of what adulthood or maturity is and our capacity to conceive ends. He goes on in his book to basically say that we, are, we, we have been teaching through music to our children how to live life because they're indoctrinated in it more than anything else. Most of the time, I have to pull earplugs out of my kids' ears that are on the team. I go, what are you listening to? I'm sure it's not sports radio um, because they can't hear us. In, in her paper um, from Liz's school, from this girl, the 17-year-old girl, she said this. Hymns were written by people who were theologians, who were primarily concerned with what a song was conveying. Interesting. In music today, are there theologians writing it or are there just music people? Melody was added because music is a powerful, as a teaching device, brings people together and was an efficient way to teach many people who were likely illiterate. And as a result, she goes on, the lyrics and the theology are the first priority of a song, not the music. Listen, Beatles picked up on Chuck Berry's thing and said that rock and roll music just can't hear some of it. Just let me hear some of that rock and roll music. Any old way you choose it. Let's get the, it's got a backbeat. You can't lose it. Any old time you use it, it's got to be rock and roll music. And the legends were born. Peace, love, and happiness entered into our homes via our cars, classrooms, TVs, movies, cartoons, and even the churches. It was here to stay. Mom and dads hated their kids' music, but it was all right with us. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a few things. Well, hang on. Um, songs were about love, peace, and happiness, and get up and dance. Uh, I don't know if you know who this guy is. But I'm sure you could recognize the sound.
Now, that sounds pretty good, but that sounds just like who? Nobody? You failed. That's America. That's Dan Peck, uh, peak of America. That's, he, what happened was he found the Lord and crossed over and took some of his sound with him, and he became a Christian artist. He wrote a book, An American Band, and he told how he took some of his music and his sound and put it into Christian uh, contemporary music. And it sounds really good. It's, it's really uh, uh, a noteworthy song, I guess you could say. Uh, it's got a lot of notes in it. He also took lonely people from his America grasp and made it uh, a Christian song. Exact words, he just changed one phrase in it. Is that right or wrong? See, we've had over 50 years of rock and roll. What has the church done with rock and roll? And where has the church lost its loving feeling? Where has the church not separated itself? We have the Calvary chapels, the ba- Southern Baptist spinoffs, the vineyard movements, Hillsong, sensor, uh, seeker sensitive, who send, tend to be more charismatic than anything in the way they do their music. They've taken the music of the 60s and 70s and made it their own. When you go to their church, churches, it, it's, it's usable in their venue. They turn up the amps, they turn on the spotlights, and the mainline churches have to catch up with them, putting on this grand performance. The numbers on these churches grow I- immensely. The, and people come out and say, they really know how to worship if you don't go deaf first. They believe they use music to evangelize, to get the youth Actually, most of this came with finding a way to focus on youth and having a youth come in and we'll get you a band and we'll make you all happy by having a good time within that concert feel. They feel if we get the kids, we'll get their parents. So in order to do that, they dumb down their services. What was the gospel that they heard? What were they hearing as the gospel? In an interview with a group member, he, wrote, he stated that he heard someone got saved through his band's song. He had come out, and he said, this guy had come up to him and said, his band's song uh, influenced him, and he, get, and he found the Lord. He says, uh, I, we know what, it, what he means. God, God used the song to draw him to Christ. But the question is, what was the song's words that said he got saved through that song? Doesn't it matter what the gospel information he gets is? And if you look at the song, I'm not going to go into it, but you, if you look at the song, it says nothing about the gospel. Nothing about the meaning of the cross. Now, someone may come up to me, and I'll have the verse later, and say, well, God will use it, and people do get saved. Well, absolutely. God uses anything. I'm not in, in, in evaluating that, but I want to be biblical and how we approach things. God can use whatever he needs to, but we need to be biblical. That's our first and foremost mandate. Uh, Now, the song he referred to was not biblically abhorrent, but does not in any way convey the information necessary for evangelism. The question is, if the purpose of CCM or any kind of Christian music is to evangelize, it must have the gospel in it, right? And it must be clear enough so you can hear it. Uh, I'm getting older now, and there's certain things I can't hear. Something's louder somewhere else. Um, we were listening to something, and it was a female singer, and the music was kind of loud, and I heard nothing about pop, 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 pop. That's about what I hear. Um, but I heard the noise in the background and the water faucet running next to me. Um, because you get to a certain age, you need to hear the words. Here, here's where we need to maintain. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by... Word of God. John chapter 5 verse 24 says, He who believes on me, uh, believes on whom sent me, has eternal life. Acts 4 12 says, There is no salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Uh, Newsboys and Third Day both did a song called Born Again that tells nothing about being born again. Uh, a good majority of today's contemporary artists are charismatic and even Catholic-backed. We have to be careful who we're listening to and why we're listening to them. Now, I'm not saying it's all wrong. Again, it's, is music neutral? That's what we've got to ask ourselves a question. I don't believe music is neutral, but I think it's individual. And music always implies 
some context in which it's written. Uh, John Lennon's song, Imagine, is horrific as far as content's concerned, right? Uh, I don't want to go through the words of that. We, we all probably have heard it. Uh, the question we have to ask ourselves is, is, can we do better? As a church, can we do better? Where do we need to change as a church? God calls us to do our very, very best with what he's given us. Is it the best we can do? So again, I'm going to repeat an interesting point. We all can remember songs of the 60s, 70s, 80s, or whatever era. Look at some of you grew up. My kids probably know songs from yesterday. Um, But our hymnals contain over 400 songs. How many of them do we know? When we come together as a body in Christ, do we look at the at a, do we look like a secular concert? I think there ought to be a difference. Do we reflect a biblical worldview or a secular worldview? Are we celebrating uh, or idolizing self? Lifting our are we not lifting up our Savior and Lord in the correct and honorable manner? And what I'm saying, and, and I'm not trying to belittle it, but we just listen to Doer of the Word, and I can't in my head separate America from that song. I grew up, I was a fan, obviously, of, uh, of America. Uh, it was one of my favorite groups, and I think I know every song on all their albums, I think. Um, do not get me singing them. You all will hate them when I'm done. Um, but music has a way of affecting our thinking. It becomes a part of who we are, for instance, let me try this one. I'm just going to give you. This, this is very interesting because I grew up with tunes, right? Listen to what they say. Scott. 
who wrote great pieces like The Powerhouse that were staples, standbots across the office to use for great comic effect in these cartoons. He drew on all these sources and wrote original music to bridge them together. His ability to quote other music, his ability to go through and quote Hoffro in one second and quote Kirchner in the next and quote a popular song in the next was really his trademark. He had to not only write music, he had to invent a technique to write music for animation and for movies. And he invented things that now we take for granted. You go to orchestra session today, if you were to go down the block, you would hear uh, musicians listening to a click. So obviously, my first exposure to music early in life was classical. Uh, I watched a lot of tunes. Uh, some of you might have also. But there's also an effect that a song will stick in your head and you will never not know what it means anymore. Uh, this song was not ever meant for just this specific cartoon, but we all know what it is, right? How do you not know what that is? Now, when I was putting this on here, my grandkid, got, I let him watch the whole cartoon so it's all on here. Um, he, said, he said, Grandpa, can I see that pink thing again? So I said, no, you can't. But the idea is music has its effect. It affects culture. And obviously... Um, well, all of us have been touched by music at some point or another. Um, God wants us, and I believe this more than anything, God has given us certain talents, and he's gifted others in, by the Holy Spirit, and he wants us to use those within the church. So many have risen up in the church that are very musically talented. But nowhere in the Bible does it state the kind of music genre we are to worship by. So what do we do? What are we to do? Um, I, I'm, I'm, this is tongue-in-cheek, so bear with me. I think the Apostle John never liked Grateful Dead. Peter may not have liked the Boston Pops. And I don't think Judas had any understanding of Judas Priest. But the Bible clearly defines what music is and gives us an understanding of what it is and gives us guidelines and for discernment and for our tastes. It's interesting, when I was a kid, I did kid things. And I hope many of you did too, right? I liked moon pies, Clark bars, sodas, tuna sandwiches, and any candy I can get a hold of on the way home from football practice. Now I'm not allowed any of that stuff except the tuna sandwiches and basically on some piece of cardboard. And my taste has changed. I hated onions, tomatoes. I, I basically I hated anything other than tuna fish and soda. And I eat everything. And I don't, I'm not allowed to partake of the sodas. I pass by a Mickey D's every day from football practice. I have Big Macs, one at McDonald's and one on the way home walking from McDonald's. I think it killed part of my growth spurt. But I will never eat at a Mickey D's as long as I live. So help me God. Um, but our standard changes. How do we measure the music that we are to listen to? How do we evaluate as obedient children of God so that we do it so we honor him? Especially when we come together corporately. Oops. Psalm, how did that go that far? Psalm 95, that's backwards. So. Psalm 95, 1 and 2 says, Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. It's commanded for us to do these things. Uh, Israel was beckoned to make a joyful sound, to raise their voices. They had been given God's grace, God's words, God's prophets, and God's salvation. We too have these things. Why do we remain silent? Now, we've started this series, and I want to bring us back to where we're at. Um, 
with this idea in Jude chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. I, re- I, re- I re- turn our thoughts over to Second Peter one three, where it says we've been given all- granted His divine power has granted us all things to pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. So we have everything that we need to live out the Christian life and and being and being enabled to defend it. So I've come up with a couple of lists. So bear with me. Uh, what is not part of a worship of the worship wars? This should never be part of it. It's not about the beat. It's not about the syncopation. It's not about how fast or how slow. It's not when it was written. You know, some people say the hymns were written long ago. They're better. Um, It's not about the theological associations of the writer. Because most of these writers in the hymn book, we don't know all their backgrounds. uh, To be honest with you. It's not about how it makes you feel. And it's not about the instruments used because somebody once came up to me, you have a drum set in church. We used to have a drum set back. We have a drum. So? We're not supposed to have drums. They're in the Bible. Uh, Last I read, they're in the Bible. The synthesizers aren't, but I'm okay with them. Uh, What is part of the worship wars? It's about a worldview of music. It is about a worldview of music. It is about the content of the lyrics. Extremely important. It's about the beauty and the aesthetics of the song. It's about the correct form of expressing the content. It is about glorifying God through, the, through our cre- creativity, giving him our, our, and I should have put this in here, not our best, our very best. You know, somebody once said, I can't sing. Well, the, nowhere in my Bible does it say you shouldn't. You can't and you won't are two different things. And... And I don't think all of Israel had perfect voices. But when they were all raised together, the bad voices weren't heard. You know, I, I love my dad. He tried his best. He'd sing in church. And it would annoy me to death. Because he would be loud and bad. So I figured I could out sing him because I had a bigger lung capacity. And we were both loud and bad. <laughs> but we sang. Um, some typical unverified assumptions of the Christian music realm. Christian music is worship music. And I, I think that's an assumption. If it says Christian music on it, and that's the genre, is it worship music? I think that's what we have to separate. A primary consideration in Christian music is how it makes us feel. That's what most people look, had made me, that really lifted my, that means nothing. Because everybody has different feeling capacity and it may have been awful to somebody else. It has to be, remember, it has to be across the board. God wants us to worship him biblically, so we're all involved. Old hymns are the best because they have continuity with the past being time-tested. Not necessarily true because there's some hymns that we've sung for years. I can show you biblically wrong. But we sang them for 100 years. New songs are the best because they connect with and speak to the present culture. Uh, Is that what we're supposed to do? My Bible is... uh, between, depends on who wrote it, uh, 4,500 years to 2,000. It's old. Should we give it up for something new? As long as the music helps me focus on my faith, it's got to be a good thing. I think that's an assumption. Uh, When I look at anything that helps me with my faith, it's go back to God's word. Uh, If you say anything, now understand something. Something can enable you and help you along the way, but I think that's an assumption. Uh, Does the Word of God then give us a framework for establishing standards of excellence? That's what we've got to ask ourselves. Because what we want to do is look at this from a biblical standpoint. It says, for you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. God gives us a framework to do it in. That means with who we are, God can use it. And we can lift up our voices together and praise him. And we'll look at that too. So what makes music Christian? That's a tough question, isn't it? Because think of the various things that you probably have in your mindsets that make it Christian. Now, I was 
I was a, and most of you know this, a baseball holic when I was a kid. And when somebody professed faith in Christ on TV, he then became, at that point, my favorite ball player. Then a few months later, when you said he did something very ungodly, he went on the other list. And, we, and I wrote to him, and I said, this, you know, we're, we're iconicizing people because they claim to be Christian. And we do the same thing because music's been given a certain label, and it's got to be Christian music. It's got to be good for you, and therefore it's Christian. But I think the Mormon Tabernacle Choir sounds pretty good. My opinion. But that's not Christian music, is it? Well, they sing the hymns of the faith. Yeah, and then it becomes, but then you've got to ask yourselves, they're singing it. How do we, it's, it's, it's a really tough conundrum, isn't it? Um, so I want to say, let's, let's kind of be biblical. Uh, so what makes a song, a song Christian are its motives and its lyrics. Its motives and its lyrics. Now, how do you judge its motives? That's, ter- that's tough, isn't it? So, so we've got to go based off its lyrics to start with. The motives should be reflecting a purpose prescribed in Scripture. The prescription we have in Scripture, it says we are to be teaching, admonishing, meditating, praying, and praising. That's the motivation behind music. Where do we get it from? We got it from, and we'll look at briefly later Ephesians a little bit, but those will give you the verses. Its lyrics need to be reflective of true biblical doctrine and not just spiritual in nature. It's got to reflect what the Bible says. Again, um, uh, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to hinder them because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not hinder him, for there is no one who shall perform a miracle in my name and be able soon after to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. For, for whoever drinks gives you a cup of water sh- of, dr- to drink because of your, of your name as followers of Christ. Truly I say to you, he shall be, not lose his reward. Now remember, what's happening is people will claim this and say, well, this plugs in. As long as it serves a purpose, it's good. This was dealing with people that, got, that Jesus says he was in dealing with and in control over the aspects of it. We want to do things biblically. He didn't tell his disciples, go do likewise. He said, no, I'll take care of the outcome. And no one knows the outcome but God. But we don't say, okay, it's good because God will deal with the outcome. We want to be biblical. And that's where I want to make sure we stay first and foremost. The culture of the church should never reflect the word of God. Should, should reflect, I'll get it right, the word of God, not ever, ever the world. And I think too often today the church is accommodating the world and we've allowed the world to anesthetize us to things that are worldly and the church is becoming worldly. The Word of God does give us a framework for establishing excellence. We have, we have been, uh, we have been, <laughs> wow, that's really good. Uh, have we been, I'll say it the right way, have we been an influence to the world? Has the church been an influence to the fallen world, or has the fallen world influenced us? Which way has it gone? We therefore need to ask God to sanctify our tastes. Remember, my tastes were, were formed because where I grew up and how I grew up. Was it necessarily bad? Well, there's, I didn't give you the bad stuff. I listened to some of the most horrible rock before a baseball game because I wanted to get amped up. And music was no longer neutral. Um, but do we do that before church? Hey, let's sit in a parking lot and have a, what is it called, a pre, pre-worship tailgate time. And listen to some real music and get us in here so that we're just all amped up to play. Um, we got to be careful. So what's the guidelines? And here, here's where I want to go this morning, and I, and I think this is the important part of this. What's the biblical guideline for music? And it's, we're going to have to change our thinking for a little bit and look at it biblically, because in the Old Testament, we've been given some very interesting things. It's always lyrics first, melody last. Know how I know this? I have 150 psalms and a book of Song of Solomon, and there is no musical score in any of it. And they're all songs, and there's many more, but they're all songs. Even Paul wrote a song. There's no music to it. It does also does not give us the right to plug in any kind of music. And I'll show you in a minute how it's, how it's set up. Well, here's the interesting thing. 
CCM, and I'm picking on them, I know that, on, on a whole, CCM is really pop music that uh, attempts to satisfy the music and musical and lyrical needs of its o- original community while reaching outward to its new listeners. And what I'm basically saying and what's come out of uh, one of the books I read is very important. They have to keep consumers what? Uh, consuming. The, the happy means you're, you're buying their product. They're in business. Um, and in order to do that, sometimes they've got to reach the world. And you say, well, that's good because Christian music's going out to people that will listen to it and they'll get the message. But if you listen to the message, it's not always there. Uh, YouTube, uh, um, I can't think of his Bono. He's a Christian. He claims to be. He's even told people his testimony. I've heard it. And, and the people are having problems what to do with YouTube. Are they Christian? Are they rock? Where do they fall into? Um, but we know what they are, right? Um, but he has a really good song called, I think it's called 40. You ever heard it? Psalm 40. He wrote the song 40. Um, and it, I'm not promoting it. I'm just saying there are songs out there that um, are sold to get people in. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard, but Alice Cooper claims to be a Christian. I don't know. Um, but... He, he obviously fits in one class. And then you got Christian bands that claim to be Christian, and are, some of them are Catholic, some of them are not. I'm not going to go into that, but here's the neat thing. And I think this is, what, this is why God gave to Israel a divinely inspired hymn book, which is div- doctrinally perfect. So I don't have to go to Christian music or Christian music later, leaders or people that are, that are claiming to give out the gospel or whatever in their music. I want to go to where God had a hymn book put up and says, here's a hymn book for Israel. Learn it. Grasp it. So when Israel sang, when Israel ex- uh, joyfully cried out to God, they were expressing truth. We know this. Why? Because God gave us 150 psalms. Now kind of compare yourself. Again, how many of the psalms do you know? A friend of mine, uh, well, it wasn't really a friend. He played on a different high school's baseball team, but we would get friends later. And he said, I'm memorizing the Psalms. I go, why would you memorize the Psalms? And it hit me right here when he said this. He goes, so I can lift up God all the time. I said, oh, no, I'm convicted. Because that's, that's what the Psalms are doing. It's lifting and glorifying God all the time. How is our music written? So let's go to First Chronicles. First Chronicles. Some of you are saying, about time you got in the Bible. First Chronicles chapter 16. Verse 4. First Chronicles 16, verse 4, says, And he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord, even to celebrate and to thank and praise the Lord, God of Israel. Asaph the chief, and second to Zechariah, then Jael, and so on and so forth. And they, at, at the end of the verse, um, he says, With musical instruments. How about that? With musical instruments, harps, lyres, and, and also Asaph played a loud-sounding cymbal. So here's percussion. Okay? So we have uh, basically your stringed instruments uh, and percussion that was at that time. And then we get in the next verse. Benaniah and Jehazel, uh, the priests, blew trumpets. So we, now we got the brass section coming in. So it sounds pretty good, right? Um, so what was it to do, though? Here's what we need to do. It's a threefold purpose. It was to celebrate, it was to thank, and to praise. Now, can we say that about our music when we're lifting up the Lord and we're pointing to the Lord? Can we say we are celebrating, we are thankful, and we are in praise? Let's, let's, let's look at them. Let's break them down a little bit. To celebrate means to remember, to be mindful, to bring to the mind, to consider. Um, when the Jewish people recited the Psalms, they were remembering what God had done for his people. How often do we recall to our minds what God has done for us? Or are we in our prayer saying, God, what have you done for me lately? See, God wanted them to use the Psalms as a reflective book 
to know what God had done. And many times it says in there how he led his people out of Israel, out from Egypt, how God had redeemed them, how God had passed over them when, by painting the doorpost with the blood and the death came upon those who were not covered by the blood, by the sacrifice of this lamb that they were protected by. And over again and over again, they celebrated that by remembering God's work and his words. Uh, this morning, we're going to take communion. It's for what? Remembrance. And if you notice what the word they use there, celebrate. We're supposed to be celebrating what the Lord has done for us. Are we celebrating? Are we taking in remembrance the truth? And then they put music to it so that it could be easily recalled. God's goodness, God's grace, God's mercy towards us who do not deserve it. It is also to thank him. It's giving a praise. It's confessing. It's throwing down. It's casting. And what it means, basically, is that these hymns of thanksgiving were thrown out or cast out to God uh, by by uh, corporately acknowledging as we come together. They sang, confessing the truths of what God had done for them together of one mind. This is what today's music is all about. Is that what our music we sing in church? Is that what it's about? According to, again, Celine's paper, she said David Crowder wrote a song, I Am, and 28 times she uses the word I, he uses the word I, me, or I am. Two verses, one bridge, six repetitions of the choruses, and never once talks about the Lord. He always talks about himself. Yet how firm a foundation says, ye are saints of the Lord, is laid for you, of the faith in, in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Fear not, I am with thee. Oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I will strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand. Uphold to my righteousness, omnipotent hand." Lifting up who God is. And lastly, it says it's to praise. Exaltation. Boasting in God. Boasting in God. Do we boast about God? Think how many people we can influence just by how we use music. A three-part harmony of celebration, thanksgiving, and praise. And then he lists the instruments. Which is kind of interesting because trumpets are used in different ways. There's going to be a trumpet blast one day and we're all going home. And in verses 7 through 36 in in 2 Chronicles, we're given the words of the song. So we have what's set forth is how to do it, the form that's to be done in. We have the choir director that's named there because later in Psalms, Asaph is called the choir director. So there must have been a choir that's involved. We have the instrumentation that's involved. And it's set to music. They're given the words and they say, now set this to music. Look at me. Look to Psalm 135. And keep your finger in Psalms. We'll be there for a few minutes. Psalm 135. It says, praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O ye servants of the Lord. It's an interesting thing. It's telling us what to do. It didn't tell us to do it. In other words, when you say praise the Lord, you haven't praised the Lord yet. The word praise the Lord basically comes from two words. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's in the imperative form. That means we're commanded to praise the Lord. And since it's in a PL stem, it means intensely praise the Lord. I don't know when the last time any of us sang intensely to the Lord. Lifted up our voices together in celebration, in thanksgiving, and in praise to the Lord. He's commanding you to do it with vigor, with intensity, with excitement.
It hasn't become a reality because he's told them to praise the Lord, but it's very much potential that, that basically could have said, okay, let's all stand and sing together. Its form is interesting because all psalms have a, 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 a form. It's a call to praise and a cause for praise. It's a call and a cause. Call and a cause. You know, you ever heard somebody that constantly repeats himself? And you say, why are you beating a dead horse? Uh, why are you beating that subject to death? But God beats the subjects to death. And he does that so we can remember the kinds of psalms he uses and how he uses them. Uh, when we talk about praise, it's two kinds of praise. There's declarative prayer, praise, which says it always deals with a specific event. He's declaring an event that's happened. Then there's descriptive. He's also dealing with a doctrinal concept that comes out of that event, describing what God has done. How many times we said it in the last couple of weeks on Wednesday night, God is the creator of God. How often have we lifted up our voices to the creator of God? And it comes out of the thoughts of Psalms. Psalms is poetry. It's meant to be poetic. In the original Hebrew, it is, it is rhythm, not rhyme. We think of poetry as rhyme. But it's rhythm. So if you want to know how the rhythm of a song goes and how you can set the rhythm, read the psalm as it's written. So, as we look at poetry, normally to us, it's, it's rhyme. Rhyme plus a beat. Hebrew poetry is the rhythm that gives you the beat. Isn't that, isn't that kind of cool? So you say, well, what should that song sound like? Well, read it. Read it. We have to read it with these thoughts in mind now that I have up here. It's synonymous parallelism, antithetical parallelism, and synthetical parallelism. What that basically tells us is how God's expressing his thoughts. Synonymous, he'll repeat himself the same thoughts, thought after thought, with different words. So one line clarifies the next. The antithetical basically is the same thought expressed by opposites. Synthetic is the same thought refined and developed and expanded. So turn with me to Psalm 3. And we're going to see a song this morning. Bless you. And we're going to focus on one word to help us get the rhythm of the psalm so we know what to do. Okay? If you see that little word at the end of verse 2, the end of verse 4, the end of verse 8, so we know where the stanzas are, right? It's the word selah, and the word selah means to lift up. It's a musical notation. It can mean a pause, a crescendo, or a musical interlude. Now here's the interesting thing. If it's a pause, let's see if I have it here. If it's a pause... It wants you to stop, stop and think. So he'll say the first two verses. So let's look at the first two verses. And he'll say, stop and think. O Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him and God. Think about that for a minute. Take time to think about that. Or it could be a crescendo. I don't think it is here, but it's basically lyrics. Um, let's see if I have that word. Yeah, crescendo. Uh, lyrics increase in profoundness. Music grows with it. So you get that intensity of the music growing. Um, go from pianissimo, very soft, to forte. Start building on it. Is that the right words? I think so, right? <laughs> yes. Um, then it could also be a musical interlude where the theme of the music throughout uh, is played. Now, kind of get this. How many of you guys have watched something and you hear the theme constantly played throughout? I'm going to give you one that will hit everybody, hopefully, in this room. Star Wars. Do you hear the theme to Star Wars almost like all the time? Every little bit, you know, oh, there it is again. I think some of the Bond movies do that too. There's a theme again. What's going to happen? Um, 
That's what you got to see. You got to hear that this theme is 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 being played throughout in this musical interlude. Uh, if you, he wants you to remember what's going on. Remember the theme. What's the theme here? What what develops the theme? His in, his enemies have increased. What are you going to do about it? So in verse three it says, "But thou, O Lord, you started. But thou, it's a difference. You can see the music growing. But thou, O Lord, art my shield about me, my glory. So it's all pointed to him, right?" He told what his inc- what's going on in his life, what the incident is in his life, and now the music starts to grow, maybe, after thinking a little bit. It's growing, and he says, oh, but, but thou, O Lord, art my shield about me, my glory in the one who lifts my head. I was crying to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from the holy mountain. And then it comes on again. Selah. Think about it. Is the music going to grow? What's going to happen here? Is the theme running through your head? Are you thinking about what's happening around, that's going on around you? I lay down and slept. So you can see that this now the music's gone back down a little bit. Right? See how it's, it's, it's developing within the context? Um, let's get a New Testament perspective real quick. A New Testament perspective basically comes from Ephesians chapter 5. Just give me two more minutes on this and we're going to do something together. Ephesians chapter 5. There are more verses. I just... Could have gone to Colossians 3.16, which is a parallel. You know what's interesting? My inability to sing is not mentioned here. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Hmm... Speaking, doesn't say singing, it says speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making a melody with your heart to the Lord. So this, get, always giving thanks for all things in his name, uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to God, even the Father. So here's what's, what's happening is within the individual, God wants to individually have us to be uh, ignited by the Spirit to use his verbiage, to come back at him, to lift up our voices. Uh, now, here's a, here's a really great thing that God does in a church. He's given a church a blessing of beautiful voices mixed in with not-so-good voices. But he wants us all to be involved. Because why? It doesn't say anything in here about quality of your voices. It doesn't even say quantity of voices. It says to do it. And it has three words here that are, that are very much in uh, distinction to each other, but yet similar. It's talking about psalms, hymns, hymns, and spiritual songs. A psalm is assumed there's to be some musical accompaniment with it. That's what it assumes. That's what the psalms do. They assume there's a musical accompaniment with it. Because the word here in Greek means solo, which means to pluck or to twang. That's the base of the word. So there should be a musical accompaniment with it. And obviously, hymns always allow, always focus on who and what God has done. That's what a hymn does. It's all about him. Makes it easy to remember. Spiritual songs means songs that are characterized by the Spirit. Songs that are characterized by the Spirit are songs that come out of the Word of God. He's influenced the Word of God. Does music teach? Absolutely, because we're warned this. He's saying, take care to what we listen to. By, what st- by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you, and more shall be given you besides. So we need to take care of what we listen to. I'm going to read uh, one, one more thing. I'm going to give you some conclusions, so bear with me, because we're going to take communion. We're doing okay with time. If someone's got a ball game to be at, we'll be all right. Most people went on vacation today, if you didn't look around. So. Um, Bloom, I'm going to close with one, a statement. For one of the closing parts will be from Bloom's American Mind, Closing the American Mind. The issue here is its effect on education. And, I, and he's talking about music. I, the, the, the issue here is the effect on education. I believe it ruins the imagination of young people and makes it very difficult for them to have a passionate relationship to the art and thought that they are substance of liberal education. 
The first sensuous experiences and divisive, decisive in determining the taste for the whole life. And they are the link between the animal and the spiritual in us. Rock music encourages passions and provides models that have no re relation to any life the young people who go to universities can possibly lead or to the kinds of admiration encouraged by liberal studies. Without the cooperation of the sediments, anything other than a technical ed education is a dead letter. But as long as they have the Walkman on, and this is, you could tell when that was written, as long as they have the Walkman on, they cannot hear what great tradition has to say. And after its prolonged use, what they take it, when they take it off, they find out they are deaf. And I think that's interesting because that guy is not a believer. And he's saying they have so deafened themselves, they cannot, by, by this music, they cannot be what God is, what, what, in my lingo, what God has wanted them to be. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 4, they said this, it says they sang together a Paul and Silas duet. I wonder what that would have sounded like. You say, oh, that must have been glorious. I don't know. I don't know. Um, here's conclusion, though. And this is, there's probably many, many more points. But music in church should be about God. It should be theocentric. Is it about God? Is the music about God? Does it lift up man or does it lift up God? Music should have all participating, the best we can produce. And some people say, oh, I, I don't get that song. I'm not singing it. Really? Really? Um, one thing I have been uh, convicted of is I got to be more involved with choosing some of the music here. Um, and I've, that's what I'm, we're going to do. We're going to work together on that. Music, music, um, music should have all participating, the best we can produce. Music is about the lyrical content primarily. It doesn't say we can't have accompaniment. Uh, music is a result of thinking. How many of you have thought of that? Some people will say, well, I listen to music so I can think. No, you're not. No, you're not. That's an aberrate. Now, I sometimes have things in the background to help me concentrate, but it's not usually music. Uh, not that it's a bad thing. I just don't have, I'm not, I'm not who I am. Music is to engrave within man God's thoughts, who and what he is, searing into our mind God's thinking. Music is not about perfect voices coming together. Listen but about voices raised together about the perfect one. Now, we're going to try something different here. And um, the, Oh, don't do that. Uh, we're going to do something really different. I'm going to hand out something, so I need Fletcher, if you don't mind coming. And I need someone else. Let's pick on somebody. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, both of you. The newlyweds. Just hand them out. Now, here's, you're getting this, and I'm gonna, I am going to repeat myself. When we're done, fold it. And put it in your hymn books. That's not good. I lost my copy. Oh, here it is. I want to re what happened? Did you get one? Yours is over here on the floor. Oh. Your assignment was to memorize this stuff. Here's what we're going to do. This is, this is going to be really strange. So, so bear with me. I'm going to read this song to everybody. You're going to follow along with me. We're, we're then going to sing it together as best we can. Because I know it's new to everybody. Okay, we're going to sing it together. I'm going to pass it, have the uh, ushers ha hand out the elements for communion. We're going to take it together, and then I'm going to play a song as we all exit. You got that? Don't worry. We'll work together on this. I'm reading the song. I'm just going to read the verse lines, okay? His robes for mine, a wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rage. Draped in his righteousness, I'm justified. In Christ I live. For in my place, he died. Sound right? This, by the way, this was written in 2008, so it is a newer hymn. His robes for mine, what cause have I for dread? God's daunting law, Christ mastered in my stead. Faultless I stand with righteous works, not mine. Saved by my Lord's vicarious death 
and life. His robes for mine. God's justice is appeased. Jesus is crushed and thus the Father's pleased. Christ drank God's wrath on sin, then cried, "'Tis done! Sin's wage is paid, propitiation won. His robes for mine, such anguish none can know. Christ God's beloved, condemned as though his foe, he as though I, cursed, accursed and left alone, I as though he embraced and welcomed home. We're going to try it. Okay, Connie, if you don't mind coming up, and James, I will switch over. Hang on. I gave this out so you can, if you read music, you know what it is. And James is going to follow along on the... Yeah.